Steve Wolf. Welcome back to the Fire Break, sponsored by Team Wildfire, innovating new technologies to save us from destructive fires. Today, I've got an amazing guest with us. This is Bart von Leeuwen, and I, I hope I'm not butchering your name too much, Bart. But Bart is, as far as I can tell, the world's leading expert on situational awareness. Uh, to my knowledge, or to the I mean, you know, in the common lapers, and situational awareness means. Uh, Right before you go out on a call, someone yells out at you, okay, guys, pay attention to what's going on around you. I don't want to see anyone get hurt. But apparently there's a lot more to it. Uh, Bart, you've been studying this for the better part of your career. Tell us what what all is involved in situational awareness. And I, and I know I'm going to ask you to distill you know, 25 years of experience, but take a shot yeah. at that. Absolutely. Well, f first of all, uh, my name was, was pretty good. I, I'm, I'm used to being, it being butchered uh, all around the world, so don't worry about that. I don't take any take any offense on that. Uh, secondly, I, I would I would argue that the, the sort of the world renowned expert is Dr. Gasway of Situational Awareness Matters, for who I work and working a lot with. I'm probably the one who pays the most attention on situational awareness and artificial intelligence. Is it? How, okay. how these two these two things uh, line up. Um, and situational awareness, the ability to perceive and understand uh, the, the, the things happening around you in, in, uh, in, in how time progresses, progresses and then be, accurate, be able to accurately predict future events in time to prevent bad outcomes. That's our... That's say, our that, say that one more time because that's a lot to absorb. Situational awareness is the ability to perceive and understand the things around you in relation to how time progressive progresses and be able to pr accurately predict future events in time to avoid bad outcomes. That okay. is the tagline from Situational Awareness Matters. That's our definition that we use. Um, and you can dissect that in, in four main categories, perception, understanding, time, and prediction. Um, and, and with all these four elements, there's more than 120 barriers for first responders or people who work in high risk, high consequence decision making environments that can actually hinder proper situational awareness. And that is what we um, at SA Matters are all about teaching firefighters, but also people who work in, in oil refineries, line workers, which is more or less related to, to wildfire, I'd say. Sure. Um, uh, Department of Transport, you name it, where people can can have um, severe risks and, and, and high consequences of the work they're doing, uh, we can help them. Um, and my specialty is, is sort of the IT background. Um, I even trained people who work in uh, network security companies. Um, although they do not suffer from personal harm, uh, like firefighters, um, if a payment system of a country goes down because people are not paying attention, the consequences are still big. Uh, there's unlikely that people will get killed, but still, you know, the the the, the effect on society is still severe. So that's they get killed still from the rioting, right? Yeah, that, well, that's what we made to believe from movies, but most of the times it will not turn out that bad. <laughs> I mean, we have okay. payment outages, payment outages now and then, but um, it's still it's it's still the idea of that. People think they understand what they see, but they're actually not seeing that and they're being hindered by any of the barriers. I see. And my, my tie in with, with artificial intelligence is that a lot of companies out there claim to create smart software, not per se artificial intelligence that claims that they can improve situational awareness without these people creating this actually being aware of the 120 barriers, 120 plus barriers. Okay. So you said there were four categories of situational awareness. Um, there's four elements that are are come into play when it comes to uh, situational awareness. And, and perception, you can recap. perception, perception, understanding, prediction, and overall there's time. Um, okay. Time. So I'm raking up leaves on the railroad track. First, I need to perceive there's a train coming towards me. Well, you, you need to see the train, and then from from if if the train getting bigger or smaller, you need to understand it's actually yes, coming okay, towards that's you. The prediction. No, that's the understanding. The understanding what you're seeing and the prediction is, is like, I got I got a minute and a half to leave this track or I'll be, well, tomato soup right. or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, and, and obviously um, uh, the time part is that um, 
if somebody would say to you while raking the leaves, it takes another five minutes for the train to come, it will be really hard for you while raking the leaves and paying attention to what you're doing while raking the leaves to keep track of time. Okay. Um, oh, it's qu it's here quicker than I anticipated. Right. That's where the time part comes in. Okay. And I imagine this happens with wildland firefighters, right? You're fighting a fire and you think you the fire is a certain distance away and therefore you'd have a certain amount of time uh, to get yourself to someplace safe. And then there could be a, a misalignment of your reality of time. Absolutely. Or or the facts could change and the, the, the wind could pick up and the yep. fire could all of a sudden be coming towards you much faster. Yeah. And, and mind you, I, I have no experience. I'm an urban firefighter for all my career for 27 years. I've been doing this. I have no, no single minute of experience in wildland firefighting, but I, I, I can translate some of the things that I've done in urban, have seen in urban firefighting. So yeah, please do. So, so when you say, well, you're, you're, you're a wildland firefighter and standing out there and looking at the fire and think, oh, I got a couple of minutes to do something. And then suddenly your chainsaw chokes and you get fixated on getting your chainsaw up and running again, for example, this will distort your sense of time. So you'll be focusing on this, this, this task of getting the uh, chainsaw up and running again. And you, can't, you cannot keep track of time. And then suddenly the fire is quicker at you than... Than you anticipated or that you thought it would be. Um, and the, the, the sad thing is, is that if you look at a lot of NIOSH reports and line of duty death reports, human factor, situational awareness is one of the key factors that, that sort of hurts or kills firefighters or first responders or anybody who works in a high risk, high consequence situation. Um, and I, I think um, one of the important things and what we do in the trainings we provide, so we, we, we with Situational Awareness Matters provide trainings in the, in the US, um, is that we want to make people understand that you cannot judge from what you see. So if you, if you see movie clips, if you see a movie clip on YouTube from a firefighter going through a roof or, or any, any bad thing happening, if you, if you look through the comments, it's just judgment. Yes. Uh, um, and, and, and as Dr. Gasaway says, it's seek not to judge, but seek to understand why did the things the firefighter was doing at the time make sense to him? Okay. Um, my statement is nobody gets in a big red fire truck to mess up. No, at, at least right. I, I, I hope so. And if somebody does, then we should get rid of him. But that's never the intention of any crew that gets hurt. No, everybody goes, goes out of the station to go home with everybody they're left with. But Sometimes right. it goes horribly wrong and they made decisions that look logical for them at the point of time. But, but, you know, in hindsight, it was the wrong decision. How did they think it was the right thing to do? And that's where the 120 barriers come into play. They, they can be organizational. They can be the way they organize their work on scene. They could be, could be stress, could be, could be a lot of things. Um, and, and so this could you is... name those 120 things for me? No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you would have said you would put me on the spot, then certainly yeah, I, I, I would I put a list so. on my screen and read them out. Uh, I, I'm guessing that if there's a hierarchy for these 120 where, you know, the top three things are the ones that are getting, you know, the vast majority of people hurt and then you know, lesser and lesser consequences as you go down the list. Is that? Oh, yeah, that right? absolutely. And, and, so and let's start uh, at the top then. Yeah. <laughs> And then go, go down to 120. You know, get top 10 or something. Yeah, yeah I, I, think, I think one of the, one of the important things is, is information overflow. And that's where my sort of my take with AI is, is that we, we claim that we can bring all the information to frontline responders. But you can only remember seven things in your prefrontal cortex uh, at any given time. And if I give you 10, there is no, um, you cannot control which Three out of ten, you're gonna forget or not. Oh, I story. see. Okay. Um, so, so there's numerous reports that people on the radio you can basically hear on the radio recordings. They have been told a certain piece of information, but it was simply too much, and they missed out on on, on some of these things. Uh, with the enormous amount of radio traffic, you see first responders working walking around with three radios. Your brain is able to basically tune out auditory exclusion. I'm just going to listen to one channel and no matter what comes out of the other channel, it will not be there. Um, I see. Uh, so yeah, information yeah. overflow is a big contributor to shutting down necessary situational awareness. So when there's a, you know, 
a lot of companies featuring new products saying like, oh, this gives the incident commanders more data, more information, more visualization, more auditor. You know, so you're, you're saying this might actually be, um, you know, uh, uh, counter helpful. Um, I'm not just saying it. I claim it is. You're uh, claiming it. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I'm actually claiming it. Yeah. And interestingly enough, if you, if you talk about talk, talk to first responders who are in these situations, um, I was in I was in Finland uh, uh, earlier last year where there was a battalion chief and and their uh, their areas are huge. So a battalion chief gets in a in in, in, a, in a truck or in a, in a van with a driver and he needs to drive an hour and forty five minutes to get on scene on his first wow. two area. Only fifty thousand people live in an area that big, so you know it's like you know you cannot put you cannot put up a fire station for twenty people. Um, but then all the fire trucks have three hundred and sixty cameras and sensor readings and everything. So from every unit that's already on scene, even from police, he can get camera streams on five monitors in the back of his van. And the first thing he says, I, I most most of them I just turn off because they're distra distracting me from the job I try to do. Okay. Well, the company was on the on the on the on the show was selling this solution as a we improve situational awareness. Well, I'm not so sure, um, and 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 I I do see because I started this whole journey probably 15 years ago with my fear. I'm afraid that something will happen to me or either one of my colleagues or the people we serve. And on hindsight, we'll find out that all the information needed from that incident from happening was actually known within our own organization. So I started this. I want more information. I want more data. And then slowly I started to realize, okay, but can I actually deal with all this data? Can I actually deal with all this information coming in? And that's when I got introduced to Dr. Gasway. And very soon I sort of glared, glared to me. It's like, okay, this is not, we cannot do this. We need to come up with a different um, yeah, with a different method of dealing with this information. So I'm not saying you should not send any information, but we have to think about what we do with the bombardment. How do we filter that so that you're receiving a, a quantity of information that you can act on yeah, without exactly. receiving so much information that yeah. you have, uh, yeah. you know, information paralysis. Yeah. 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 So inf information, information overload is, is, is one of the, one, one of my favorites because it's so dear to my IT background and, and the thing that we are, that we are creating um, as well, but there's all sorts of, um, other barriers. Um, one thing which is close to me because actually it was quite recent that it was the anniversary, sort of anniversary of, of a, of a fa uh, line of duty death in the Netherlands. Uh, freelancing, that people just show up on fire scene and start working because they think they need to do something and then incident commanders had no idea that two people were still in a burning building when they gave the evacuation order. I see. And then and then later on, they figured out by counting the SCBAs in the fire truck, they were still missing two people that nobody noticed on scene. It's, it's a barrier called freelancing because they, they showed up on scene. I'm a firefighter. I know what to do. I've done this multiple times. Just go to work because the work needs to be done. But you have no idea about the big picture. You, you have no situational awareness. You have not heard incident command say, well, maybe we should evac evacuate the building because of the, the structure integrity, for example. Right. And, and there's, there's, there's a whole lot of these, 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 these barriers that through best intentions, because these, these two poor firefighters that died had the best intention, right. Helping at that fire. There was actually somebody still missing. There was a victim still unaccounted for who was later found near the firefighter. So they were in the right direction, but they should not have been there, which is a shame. I see. Uh, so learning about, you know, how situational awareness works and what, the barriers are to accurate perception and dis decision making process. Uh, to what degree are people able to implement that knowledge so that they get better situational awareness? Because um, <clears throat> if you say just say here are the 120 things you need to know about, okay, now you're good to go. Yeah. So so, so when we provide the trainings, and one of the things I always say is like I get good news and I get bad news. I'm not gonna. I'm not going to tell you all the 120 barriers in the training because you're not capable of remembering them. But the ones that we do discuss, I cannot give you a certificate that it will never happen to you again. Okay. Uh, and, and even for me, I, I, I'm, I'm allowed to call myself expert in this field. And now and then when I go back 
with my fire truck, with my crew back to the station. And I sort of recap the incidents like, oh, okay, you got lucky there. You didn't think everything through. Um, so, so there is no guarantee that you can train people to always have proper situational awareness. But what we did do in, in, in the Amsterdam Fire Department where I work, in 2015, we almost lost two firefighters uh, in a relatively simple fire, not, not, not one of your freak incidents. And that basically shook the fire department. And we, we created a program, uh, or the, the fire department created a program, which is called Stop and Think. And okay. That was really, okay, before, before, before you put your head down, just run in, think about, is the thing that you want to do really the smart thing to do? Um, and... From that line on, I invited Dr. Gasaway to come over to Amsterdam to, to talk about situational awareness. And, and so our relationship sort of grew stronger. And then I started to um, be more interested in, in get the training to be a, a certified master instructor for Gasaway. Um, and then we, start, we started looking at, okay, what can we implement? And one of the things, and that's a sort of a neurological process that by, by Dr. Kahneman, thinking fast and slow, is that the, the, the fast part of our brain, the intuitive brain, tends to sort of quickly see things and make a decision, this is what you need to do. And that's, in general, how we make, on the fire ground, make decisions. Um, but it's not always the best thing. So you, what you're looking for is sort of finding a balance to, to this intuitive, quick reaction. Right. And this deliberately thinking about what you're trying to do. Okay. So the thing is, evolution's played a big uh, role in when we're using our fast thinking versus our analytical thinking, right? When the, when yeah, the tiger the, swipes at you, you, let's not analyze, oh, how many claws has he got? Like, move your head out of the way. Exactly. And, and the thing is, obviously, in that time, life was relatively simple. You either were looking for food or you, you were food that being looked at. Uh, yeah. you know, so, so you need your reflexes to, be, to, to, to flee. But our world is so inherently complex nowadays that evolution has not sort of caught up and right. is, is capable of, of processing that all. So okay. what your brain does for you is filtering the world to make it a um, comprehensible environment where you sort of can relax work in. And I, I, I think that the best examples is people who do not have these filters um, are people with extreme forms of autism. Extreme um, what? Forms of autism, autistic people. Okay. Um, so if you look at Rain Man, the movie Rain Man, you've probably seen that. Yes. This person cannot function in the world because he is deliberately perceiving everything and registering everything. The amount of stones in the pavement, the amount of words in a book, the, 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 the amount of buttons on a shirt, everything is... And he's not able to sort of operate and, and, and walk around through the world because his filters are not working. I see. Uh, but he sees everything. He, he remembers every letter. He remembers every book. But he cannot function in, 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 in day-to-day life. So the filters that your prefrontal cortex puts in, in your head help you to sort of unconsciously filter out things that are irrelevant and make your okay. conscious brain only look at the things that are relevant. But that's risk that you, as a firefighter, you go into situations that things might get filtered out, which, well, sh- should not have. Um, and that's where you come, come to the point. It's like, how could they do that? Well, you know, some of the stuff that you see while looking at this video, for some reason, is filtered out from their perception. So they have a different understanding of the environment they're in, make different predictions, and they fail miserably. Fascinating. Yeah, when you talked about stop and think, you know, before you jump and run into the burning building, you know, I thought of uh, Samuel Jackson in the movie where his line, you know, someone says to him, uh, you know, we need a plan of attack. And he says, I've got a plan. Attack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. But, uh, and, and was... you know, the, the, the thing is, and especially when it comes to, 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 to using information technology, I always make the joke in my presentations, like it's socially not accepted that a fire truck pulls up in front of your burning house and people start scrolling on their iPads for 10 minutes before, before they get off. Um, right. We do not hire the people who do that. We hire people who jump into action. Um, and stop and think is not like, okay, stop and nobody moves and we're going to have a meeting for 10 minutes about what the next cause of action is. It's just a, a brief moment of, okay, do I 
really understand what I see. Um, what am I missing? You know, sort of have this this curiosity in, in you're looking at the fire scene. And how many times I, I, I heard from the previous um, uh, podcast you recorded that you've been a firefighter as well. Uh, the, the best example is automated fire alarms. Uh, all that, is that what? I'm sorry? Automated fire alarms. Okay, yes. Yeah, so, so in, a, in a shopping mall or whatever, then, oh, like for the sixth time this week, this alarm goes off. And and you just go in there, it's like, oh, yeah, we just need to go to that panel and then click a switch and then we're done with it. If that happens enough, yeah, you're not wondering anymore while you're walking. You're not curious anymore. While you're, you're probably not even looking around when you walk in. Just like, oh, yeah. we're just gonna we're just gonna walk to this is something that happens to everybody. It happened to me early on in my career that I got caught up with that problem. It never happens again because I got almost badly hurt very early on in my career. But this is something that's really common. People lose their curiosity on the fire ground and then get hurt. Um, so it's this... like the security guard at the bank, right? Ten thousand times he goes to work, there's no bank robbery. So yeah, exactly. You, you, exactly. Know, you, lower, you lower your expectation that something bad's going to happen. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And and, and obviously for bank guard, you, you you sort of hope that nothing happens. And and if you're in the fire service, you you know, when the alarm sounds, if the pager goes off, something bad has happened. So you better be you always be on you know on, on guard. So what are the steps that you take? Do you like, you know give yourself a five second ritual when I hear the pager, remind myself X Y Z. You're going into a situation that could be very dangerous. You might not get home if you don't pay attention to what's happening. Yeah, I, I, how, I, how do you how do you talk yourself into being more situationally aware in a, in a, in a quick way so that you you know give yourself a little refresher in it every time? Is this what I expected? Is this what I expected? That's one of the first things that I ask when I come on scenes. You build sort of an image in your head, and when you go on scene, there's I'll pro it probably looks like this. Um, and then while you're, when you arrive on scene, my first question is, okay, is this what I expected? Does it look anything like I expected? Is there, is there something odd uh, going on here? Um, and, and when you get a lot of information, either from dispatch or from your information system, we tend to be acting upon that information. And I try to figure out what's the stuff I do not know. What part of information would I like to know, but I haven't heard? Because that's where your sort of your hidden risks are. Nobody knows about that. And, um, with the and it's not a wildfire thing, but uh, with with sort of the, the 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 renewable energies, are there solar panels on the roof? Nobody told me there are solar panels on the roof. I have no idea if there are solar panels on the roof, but it does influence, you know, how the electricity system in the house operates. Even if we think we flick the main switch, it's still it getting back fed, right? Exactly these kind of things. I see. Okay. So with with regard to our ability, our 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 ability to process, you know, quantities of data uh, mm -hmm. that are greatly exceeding anything we've ever had to do before. I think it sounds like we make a lot of assumptions erroneously that we can handle more data than we think we can. And, you know, I read a book in my, in my twenties, it was called breathing space. Mm -hmm. and it was talking about, uh, uh, you know, how to have more of a sense of, not being under so much pressure all the time and information overflow was one of the big culprits in there. Oh, and yeah. the, a fact that they pointed out in this book, they said, it, they said that there were more data points in a single issue of a Sunday New York times than most people would come across in their entire lives 200 years ago. Oh yeah. I, I, and yet I we, you know, we sit and read it and think like, oh, I got all this, I got all this, I got all this. Yeah, and, and our brains didn't evolve in these 200 years to be capable of dealing with that. That's, that, that's, that's right. That's absolutely it, yeah. Right. And I, I, think, um, I think that's where my interest in, in the, the, the hybrid artificial intelligence part comes in. I, I do believe that, that artificial intelligence can play an interesting role in, um, in solving some of these problems. But we need to... We need to be very cognizant of, of some of the challenges ahead, um, and, and that's in some of the talks I give. I, it's what I call the four elephants in the room that nobody talks about. Everybody talks about AI, puts an AI batch on everything, and we're doing AI, so we're doing the, the best thing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and starts 
sort of ignoring my four element uh, elephants. So if you allow me, I want to quickly touch upon them. It's it's like yes, it's, please. It's the data quality elephants. It's like, the fire service as an industry is really bad at reporting data. Um, if you, I've, I've done a project on the National Wildfire Coordinating Group, and if you see the enormous scattered domain of all the institutions who are involved in wildfire and wildland firefighting in the U.S., and the problems they have, the National Wildfire Coordinating Group, the challenges they have of combining this information so that it's coherent and that things align and that things are the same and, and, and terminology is the same. It's a monumental task. But if you want to, if you want to do really good AI, you need a lot of really good quality uh, data, and we simply do not have that. So people who start claiming, "Oh, we can we can predict fires with AI," and we, and especially in the urban environment, I don't believe that because we we're not capable of producing enough quality data yet. I think the sort of the outlier in this is when you talk about fire behavior in the wildland space. Some of the projects that's being done with the Western Fire Chief Association on these models, how wildfires will move through the landscape are really good. But that's because the amount of parameters, although large, is still relatively limited to that of an urban environment. I see. Um, and, and they are doing fantastic work. Then the, 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 second, the second elephant in the room is that AI is not really good at sort of detecting and working with outliers. AI is really good at finding um, the most acceptable answer. If, if, you, if you play with ChatGPT, you might have done that if you, if you do ChatGPT. Sure. Um, what it does, based on an enormous corpus of text, provides you with a grammatically sound, coherent, socially acceptable answer because it will give you an answer based on what most people have said about that subject and then creates a sentence out of that looks coherent. So it's, it's the danger of consensus. It's the danger of consensus, which right. is fine. 20, if you, 20 doctors all agree leeches are the best way to do it. Everyone knows that. Exactly. And, and which is fine if you want to have like a nice sounding piece of text about a very common uh, subject. Like right. write, me, write me a paragraph about um, for, for 500 words why I should visit Amsterdam. You probably get a really, you probably get a really to good. To see you should be on the list. <laughs> no, I, I'm not that vain. Um, but but you probably get you get you probably get 500 words that, that actually describe very good reasons why you should visit Amsterdam. Yes, because there's so much information about it. But the fires we go to are outliers. Every instance you go to is outliers. No, there's no two instances are the same. There's always a parameter or something a factor which is different on instance. So that's where AI is really bad at. So claiming that AI will give you the right answers to an incident that has not occurred yet is really dangerous. Okay, obviously. Because the, the algorithms are not made for that. Then the second one is we talked about how uh, a human perceives uh, the world, but the way you perceive the world is extremely personal. The way you make decisions is extremely personal based on your 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 cultural background, your, your, the way you, you're being brought up, your schooling, your experience, your, your walk of life, everything you've ever experienced in life influences how you make your decisions. That okay. means that if you want to have a piece of AI who advises you to make the best decision, he needs to have a really good understanding of who you are to be able to influence your decision-making process. And the best example where you can see this is flawed, if you have a satellite navigation system or Google Maps or whatever in your car and you drive home, there is a fair chance the last 20 miles you will simply ignore anything the system says because you know how to drive home. And right. you get, then you get, get up in a traffic accident that the system knew, but you ignored because you were stubborn. Right. And, and, and that's how we, that's where I say, well, we claim that we can advise people to do make better decisions on their day-to-day -day jobs, but simply following your navigation system is already hard for a route you take so often. Okay. So if so, you have a firefighter going into a scene where he thinks, I've got this under control, and the system tells him something, there's a fair chance he might simply ignore it. I've done this a hundred times. I know how to do this. I'm just ignoring Google Maps. Right. I don't need a computer to tell me how to do my job. Exactly, exactly. So that's sort of the third, the third elephant. And, and the biggest elephant in the room for me are the ethical and legal consequences of using this technology in emergency response. 
what if if I'm an incident responder, I got a piece of AI and I do not care how it inter interacts with me. It could be spoken word in my ear or whatever. And I make a decision where two people die. Who's legally responsible? Who's legally responsible for the consequences of the decisions I make based on advice from an AI system? And even if we come to a point that we could waive this responsibility, is it ethical to let me live with the fact that I made a stupid decision on a stupid piece of software that got two people's guilt? I guess the, I guess it gets kind of like the self-driving cars issue, though. You know, you could get killed making your own stupid decision, or you could get killed by a decision made by a computer. Exactly. Is is one ethically more wrong than the other? I I mean I don't have an answer for this, but it's, we're not having the discussion when we're starting using all this technology. Um, and this is where the, the the human hybrid artificial intelligence field, the research field, comes into play, where all these streams of data quality and algorithm quality, but also legal and ethical issues come, come, come in one field, which is super interesting. And there is an Italian lady who did research, and her father was actually a volunteer firefighter. Probably that's why I really liked the research, where she talked about adjunct AI. Um, and in her research and research that has been done is shown that if you have professionals and firefighters or emergency responders are professionals by definition, and you start feeding them with step-by-step -step instructions, they they get disenfranchised yes. with their work. Would you want to have a physician you go to who is disenfranchised with his work? Not really. <laughs> Not really. Although I'm, I'm looking for one that is franchised, actually. <laughs> because when I go to the doctor, they, their whole, I've never seen my doctor's eyes. You know, I walk in there and like, they pull out the laptop, da -da -da, what are you taking? Da -da, did anything change? Okay, great. Let me send, where's your pharmacy? Da -da, great. Okay. We'll see you back in six months. Yeah. And that's it. That's, it's terrible. What exactly you know, but, so what this, what computers have done to, 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 even, to medicine. So even, I can only even. imagine. Even there, do you want your front? Do you want your your frontline emergency responders to be disenfranchised with the task at, at hand? It's like, oh well, the stupid thing will tell me what to do. So in in their research, they they played, um, they they tried a method where they said, okay, um, let's see if we can organize some sort of a dialogue with with the experts, where okay. the system might give hints, but do not tell exactly what to do. And that's a field which I really like. You know, I, I, I do not believe that smart algorithms can actually accurately predict what's going to happen on a fire scene. But if they're based on the information they have and, and, and the reasoning they can do, say, well, this might not be what you expect. You might want to do a stop and think moment and sort of have a second look at it. It gives me the freedom to say, oh, okay, let's have a look. And that's like, well, I have no clue what the system's talking about. Or it could be like, oh, I didn't see that. Thank you. Um, and if you, if you build this, this, this relationship um, in, in, a, in a proper form and train the people to use that, um, I, I think there, there's, good, you know, there's, there's good use cases of using artificial intelligence in that way. Um, and, and one of the things that, that I've said early on in, in, in this, this sort of endeavor of mine of bringing more information to the front line is that my, my dream user interface in the front of a fire truck is a big screen with five lines of text with big enough font that even my colleagues who wear glasses and are, have poor eyesight and I can still read it like fonts like this big with a maximum of five lines of thought provoking things. You need to think about this or have you thought about that? But also, the screen could also be empty. If the AI thinks, oh, Bart's on the front of the fire truck, he's being sent to this incident, uh, I find no weird stuff about this. He's a professional, he can deal with this. Because then the screen is blank, it's like, okay, there's nothing to tell me. But when we go to an incident and there's two lines on the screen, it's like, oh, wow, that's interesting. Right, because store fireworks in the basement here. Good to know. Whatever. Uh, yeah. The facade is a small shop, but it's 20,000 square feet. You know, it's like uh, you might want to send your firefighters in with a line, these kind of, these kind of things. That could certainly, certainly help because one of the problems you see with sort of the stationary, basically every, every incident command system nowadays looks the same all day, every day. 
it's like a map. Okay. And, and so there's a fair chance that you start filtering it out. The system never gave me useful information, so I just kind of ignore it for a bit. So but this sounds like up, a. I'm sorry. This yeah. sounds like a technique that retailers use to break people's expectations so that they're paying attention. Is that you know every time you go into whatever store, they've rearranged everything. So exactly. that it's new, right? And so you're not taking the, the, the map for granted, so to speak. Perfect example. Perfect example. Oh, uh, that was not here before. Oh, let me have a look. Let me, oh, there, there's, a, uh, there's an action item. Oh, it's really cheap now. I just buy it. I mean, that's. <laughs> right. So, so <laughs> yeah. they have to get your attention in order to have you make that decision. And if it's the same all day, every day, you just start to sort of, just start to ignore the, 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 the line with the cookies because you know it's bad for you. So you know, I'm just not going to walk in there because I know it's there. I'm just going to eat it. Or you go it. for the line with the cookies. Oh, yeah, okay, that could be the other option. <laughs> you know, right? Because because even though you have knowledge about what the cookies do to you, right? Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, yeah. We don't we don't necessarily act on knowledge. And so what, what you're saying, what you were saying before, is just giving people information doesn't guarantee good decisions, right? Or else we wouldn't have you know the levels of diabetes and lung cancer that we have. What if I told him not to smoke. What else does he need to know? So it's really funny that you bring smoking up. I was once given a, a, a given a talk on a, a healthcare insurance company here in Europe, uh, where they said with, with proper information, we can, yeah, we, we have better information. We can inform our clients better. And I was like, well, everybody knows that smoking is bad, but just simply did not succeed. So, you know, you're missing you're missing an emotional human That's side right. of, you know, this persuasion is not a, isn't just data, right? It's not a rational, it's not pure rational. There is emotion involved. So, yeah. So what did you come up with, with the, uh, with the smoking thing? Uh, I, I don't have an answer for that. Um, it, it, it's more that <laughs> I, I like to, uh, what's the English expression? Uh, the, throw a stick in, in, in these kind of discussions, like the, yeah. the, the, the whole, right, the throw whole event. a wrench in the works, whatever. Exactly. Right? Yeah. yeah. The whole event was about how data is going to improve, you know, how is their, their healthcare perspective. And I was like, well, you know, there's, there's a couple of things that everybody knows. And uh, from, from the fire service, it's, it's, there was a Dr. Um, uh, Burton Clark. Who, who, yes. Who's, he'll, who's, he'll be on the show next month. Ah, perfect. Uh, and he says, oh, yeah, all this advanced technology. Do you wear a seatbelt? No, so you have, you, you, you're trying to, 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 to spend enormous amounts of time and money to create, create really advanced technologies to keep firefighters safe. But the simplest thing, which is in the fire truck for 40 years that keeps firefighters safe, you're not using. Why would you use AI? Yeah. <laughs> right. It's a cultural thing. So I... I have to admit, that's the first time that I started looking at like, oh yeah, I don't wear my seatbelt all the time either. And I'm, I'm, I'm wandering around the world saying how AI could be of benefit to me and I'm not wearing my seatbelt. It's like, right. I started wearing my seatbelt. So that's a place where actuarial data could be useful because it teaches you to focus on the thing that has the most likely consequence on your survival, not the thing that's the... Uh, Shiny. You know, best marketing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Right. No, nobody makes money off of telling you uh, not to smoke. No one makes money off of telling you to wear your seatbelt. Yeah. Right? Whereas there's a lot of you know money to be made selling your department and you know a new AI system or the the latest you know yeah. infotech. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm 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 curious if I end up in a flame war if you post this on social media. But <laughs> so, so so if you only had a you know couple of minutes with a new fire crew uh, and they're you know the the alarm's gonna ring in five minutes you know how would you summarize what would you tell these these guys and girls uh, to increase their likelihood of coming home alive like Ooh. how would you distill down you know your great right? because if you try to unload your 25 years of data on them you're gonna do to them what you know what AI could do to them right so how do you summarize it I, I, th I think the, the most important part would be the, the stop and think. Uh, if, if, you, if you go with, uh, with senior firefighters, they have so much in their, in their backpack on which they can use to, to, to assess the situation. Newer firefighters simply do not have that. So take a deep breath. And it's actually one of the first lessons I got learned when I got my first fire station assignment in Amsterdam. One of the old firefighters kept me back and he said, look up before you look, walk in. 
which is brilliant, brilliant things like stop, look up, sort of quickly absorb, absorb the building. Like, what are you running into before you yeah. run in? It's a stop and think moment. It was not called that like that, but it was a stop and think moment. And I kept doing this like, okay, what is it that I'm walking into? Um, so it's kind of a stop and observe. Exactly. And, yeah. and because stop and think, okay, what am I supposed to be thinking about? Well, that's, that's the whole perception, understanding, and, and prediction part. Um, the, the, the four sort of guidelines I, I, I give to people for, for general situational awareness is um, be in a state of wonder. For every incident you go to, be as if it's your first time in Disneyland as a four-year-old. That's great. Be in a state of wonder. Stay curious. By the time... You start to think, I've seen everything at this incident. That's when it's going to bite you. you know? So yep. be, stay curious up to the moment that you step in with your whole career in a fire truck and go back. Be critical. Um, be critical about your own um, uh, judgment and your judgment of others. You know? So I made this decision. Okay, was this really a good decision? Uh, and And... The fourth thing is dare to come back from your decisions because, uh. because too many times in the reports, people thought it was a bad idea they were doing, but they were not brave enough to say, okay, we're doing a stupid thing. Let's move out of here. You know, so be, make your decision, be critical of them, and then when needed, get out and make a new plan or get out and give up. But, but, and, and I know talking to you as fire audience, this made me... Make me get tomatoes and, and torches and pitchforks. <laughs> no, this is great. Like, be brave enough to know when it's time to change your mind. Exactly. Be brave enough to know when it's time to change your mind. These are the four things that I would tell younger firefighters. Wonder, curiosity, judgment, and brave enough to step out. That's probably that's, it. That's an amazing takeaway. Okay. Well, Bart, Bart, I am I'm to entirely fascinated with, uh, with the studies that you've been doing for so long uh and i'd love to have you back on the on the fire break again because this yeah. is such an important topic uh absolutely you, you know that we really we get lost in the technology we get lost in the it <laughs> yeah. and we don't realize that the the weakest part of the system is the one between our ears exactly that yeah that's the, the one, one that gets us killed yeah yeah Great. so one of one of the things that um i'm still you, you've been in the movies right yeah many times uh, uh discussion I've had with a couple of people within the fire service in this technology space is that I wanted to redo the end scene of A View Good Man, where Jack Nicholson is taking the stand and um, uh, Tom Cruise uh, asks him, ask him something and you want to know the truth? Um, I want the whole truth. the truth. I can't handle the truth. And I want to remake that with a fire officer where he says, I want all the data. And somebody screams at him, you can't handle all the data. <laughs> That's brilliant. That's brilliant. You don't Some, need to make the whole movie, right? You just need to shoot that one scene. You cannot handle all the, the data. data. You can't handle the data. Exactly. That's really great. Okay. Yes. Well, you know what? We'll reach out to Jack Nicholson and see if he'll, <laughs> he'll, he'll voice over that for you. <laughs> yeah. But that's, that's, that's really true. That's, some, that's something that's in, in, in the back of my head. It's like I somehow at some point in time, I need to find a couple of people who are capable of sort of remaking that scene with that specific. Like you want all the data. You can't handle all the data. You're not capable of doing that. So. And, and it's, it's, it's so true. Uh, Bart, for uh, our Firebreak audience who wants to get in touch with you, learn more about what you're doing, read your research, visit your website, what's the best way for them to pursue um, that? I, I think they're going to publish this uh, with my LinkedIn link. That's probably the, the best. That's LinkedIn? I, LinkedIn, okay. that's probably what I keep, uh, keep up to date the most, which links to my blog where I wrote a couple of Same articles. Here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Excellent, which is where we met. Yeah, exactly. So great. Perfect. Well, Bart, thank you so, so much for, for joining me today. Thanks for uh, having this me. This has been one of my best episodes. When I say my best episodes, you know, it's only like the fifth <laughs> one I've ever recorded. So it's not so much, but uh, thanks. Thanks so much for joining yeah. us. And, you know, the, 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 the entire d disaster response community has so much to learn from you. So I hope, thank you. I hope they thank follow you. up. I really it do. Was a, it was my pleasure to be on the show. Great. Thank you so much, Bart. You've been listening to or watching The Fire Break with Steve Wolf. We're sponsored by Team Wildfire. Join us back here on our next episode. Thanks so much.